Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the virtual launch of the Poison Pen of best-selling author Robert Dugoni's fabulous new spy thriller, The Last Agent. As you see, we have copies here, and even better, they are autographed by Bob. So, do not, I know, woohoo, indeed. Do not, do not pass up an opportunity. I have been thinking, reading this in the A-Sister, Bob, that these are a lot like early John le Carre, except with more action. Does that seem fair well, to you? I, I will take that, and I'll tell you, that's a heck of a compliment. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I really mean it. Um, you know, I've been to almost all the places in The Last Asian. I have been across the, you know, the Black Sea from Istanbul to the Crimea and back. I've been to Oslo and the Acker House Fortress and so forth, and it was so much fun to revisit them. But um, you may ask, do you have to read The Ace Sister in order to read The Last Agent? And the answer is no. You, you will have a slight spoiler in the sense that since our hero has returned, you will know he made it through The Ace Sister. But it won't just, sorry, it is a spoiler. But beyond that, you will be fine. So we've been with Robert Dugoni from the very beginning, from the David Sloan series. He's now written the Tracy Crosswhite series. Uh, Charles Jenkins, that is what this is, The Ace Sister and The Last Agent, The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell, The Seventh Canon, Damage Control, and way back at the very beginning, he wrote a nonfiction book called The Cyanide Canary, which is the only book we haven't done an event with Robert Pagoni for. You rat, you wrote that before we met. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> it was, but I, it, you're absolutely right. You and I have been together for probably 20 years. It's really been a long time wow. through, through some interesting ups and downs. And I cannot tell you how happy I am that Bob has landed on the upside. Now, our host this evening is Angie Kim. Uh, this is our, what, at least our third event with Angie. I she's, think so, yeah. Right. She's a wonderful, um, a wonderful interview, but she's a wonderful host as well. And Angie is the 2020 Edgar winner for Miracle Creek. And I know it's been nominated for other books, but I'm not sure. To be honest, Angie, I haven't looked. What else have you done? <laughs> um, it won the ITW Award, uh, the Thriller Award, um, for Best uh, First Novel. And um, uh, I, I don't I, I don't. And then there are a bunch of other things that haven't been quite announced yet, so. Well, I have to say that Miracle Creek is a really interesting book, and even I, when I read it, wasn't entirely sure what it was. It's partly, <laughs> it really wasn't. It's partly courtroom thriller, it's partly medical drama, it's partly family drama, it's all kinds of things. And I'm delighted that the mystery writers weighed down on the side of it being a great, and in fact, their best first mystery pick for this year. So Angie, I know that you're a fan of Bob and you've done lots of homework, so I'm gonna sit back and see what you have to ask him. Yay, okay, thank you so much, Barbara. Um, Bob, I'm so happy for you and congratulations on the launch. Here's my little glass of wine. You don't have any, you don't have any, oh, Barbara, you, you have a bottle of water? No. What kind of a launch celebration toast is that? Well, it's really okay. weak, but I have to drive home yes. when this is over, so... Um, well, it... yes, I, I'm already home, so I, I don't have that excuse. So, um, so congratulations. Um, Thank you. And, Bob, um, I just wanted to read um, from the Publishers Weekly Review, just because I love, I love this uh, quote, and, I, and this is exactly how I felt about it. They said of uh, The Last Age of Fast and Furious sequels in 2019's The Eighth Sister, Dugoni writes with such immediacy that readers will feel as if they're standing alongside Jenkins as he contemplates his next death-defying move. Fans of, fans of espionage fiction are in for a high-octane thrill ride. I just have to agree. I loved how fun and thrilling it was. It was so suspenseful. My heart was like pounding for so much of it. And I think a lot of it is because I cared so much about the characters that I couldn't turn the pages fast enough because I wanted them to be okay. Um, so I'd love to start by asking you to just give us a quick description of The Last Agent and how, um, and the series, I guess, in, in, in general with the eighth sure. sister too. Sure, well, um, probably the best story was uh, when I wrote The Eighth Sister, 
uh, I really wasn't necessarily intending on writing a sequel or a series. And uh, when the book got to my publisher and it was read by my editor, uh, Gracie Doyle, uh, she was the first one that sort of suggested that, you know, maybe you might want to bring Charles Jenkins back. And so we started putting our heads together and um, literally I called her back and said, Grace, if you take a line, the last line in this one chapter out, make it ambiguous, I can write you a second book right now. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so The Last Agent is the sequel to The Ace Sister. And Charles Jenkins, when he's in Russia and he's trying to get out the first time, he's helped by a woman and she literally saves his life. She gives up her life for him. Uh, he's back home. He obviously has been tried for treason and acquitted. And he's living at home, and uh, a young man, um, Matt LaFleur, comes to his house and says, um, you know, Mr. Jenkins, I'm with the CIA, and Jenkins can't believe that they would have the gall. And then LaFleur says, we're trying to find somebody, and we think that she is in Lepertovo prison in Moscow. And so they don't know for sure whether the woman who saved Jenkins and the ace sister is still alive or not. But when Jenkins hears this, there's no way he's not going back. Yeah. But this yeah. time it's different because this time when he goes back, he has to give himself up in a sense. He has to identify himself in order to get enough information to keep him on the move. So um, as the Publishers Weekly review was kind enough to say, he's running from the moment he lands until the moment he's trying to get out because uh, they're after him immediately. Yeah, definitely. And what was so fun about it was that it had that Mission Impossible type of feel to it, yeah. where it's just a series of obstacles and each one is more difficult than the next. But even more than the chase and sort of the physicality of it and you know being able to sort of put yourself there, the thing that was so impressive was just how smart these characters are. They are so clever and they're so strategic. And um, at one point, you know, they, there's uh, references to magic and there's also references to chess. And I wondered, are you a chess player? Because I, I couldn't help but think the way that they're think talking about it, look, sort of thinking four or five moves ahead and sort of the strategy that that entails, it sounded to me, my, one of my sons is a chess player and it sounded exactly like that. Uh, um, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, I didn't know this it, as I started it, but um, magic is a big part of the Central Intelligence Agency, at least in the training of boots on the ground soldiers. They would literally bring in magicians to teach them sleight of hand, to teach them uh, distraction, and if they wanted to drop something and, and move along. And so they would literally bring them in, and it was part of their training uh, at the farm in CIA. Wow. And so, um, you know, once I once I began to understand that, I, I began to think about, okay, how am I gonna how am I gonna use this stuff? Uh, the chess is a really it's a really interesting um, thing. I I I am not a good chess player. I can play chess, but I'm not good at it. But the whole time I was writing that scene where Jenkins uh, says to Fedorov, or Fedorov says to Jenkins, you want to play chess. The whole time I was writing that scene, I was saying, I'm going to cut this. I'm going to cut this. I'm going to cut this. Because I didn't have any idea what it was going to do with the rest of the novel. And then about 50, 75 pages later, when Fedorov is about to walk out and Jenkins hands over his money, even though he hasn't completed the task, mm -hmm. Fedorov looks at him and says, why are you giving this to me? I haven't done what you asked me to do. Yeah. It's because Jenkins remembers the chess game and he says, because it's not about money for you, it's about winning. And this is the only way you're gonna beat the FSB who fired yeah. you. Yeah. And all of a sudden I went, that's why the chess game is in the book. So yeah. um, I have a friend who is an excellent chess player. Okay. And so I said to him, okay, let's walk through this and kind of help me with some of the lingo. I don't want to get too deep into the detail, but right. help me with the lingo. And, um, you know, the other thing you mentioned about the cleverness of the characters, um, again, I'm not that clever. Uh, I have a lot I, of good friends. Uh, I don't know. You wrote it, so I'm guessing you are. I, I have a lot of good friends who are bush pilots, and um, 
adept at scuba diving and uh, you know all kinds of things. And um, I re I'm like uh, I'm like uh, what's her name? Uh, I rely on the kindness of strangers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so speaking of, okay, speaking of which, the kindness of strangers, I have like uh, this whole list of questions, but I am just so fascinated by our conversation that I'm not even looking at it. But um, I did want to ask you the origin story, because there are some tantalizing details in the acknowledgments of both this novel and in the acknowledgments of the Eighth Sister, where you talk about sort of um, stories that sort of fall into your lap and stories that have been told to you by others. And so I wanted to ask about that and and just how you got into, you know, this character um, who I know is um, a close friend, is drawn from a real life person, but also just this whole, you know, plot point in Russia and all of that sort of stuff. Tell, tell yeah. us how you came up with this. Um, you know, years ago, I read a book by Kristen Hanna called The Nightingale. And Kristen is represented by the same agent that I am, Meg Ruley, at the Jane Rutt Rosen Agency. And I, I emailed Kristen and I said, where, where did you get this story? And she was the one who said to me, sometimes great stories fall in our lap and we just need to get out of their way. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I was at home and I was working on some projects and I got an email. And the email was from a gentleman who said that he had read my latest novel and he found out that I'm from Seattle and he's from this area. and. Um, would, would I like to sit down and have a cup of coffee? And you're a writer, so you know the answer to that question is no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm having a cup of coffee. Right, right. Uh, about two days later, he had, he had read The Jury Master. About two days later, he had finished two more books in the Davis Long series. And so he said, you know, I'd love to have a chance to just grab a cup of coffee. And I kind of put him off again. Finally, he had read the whole series, and I thought, okay, this guy is serious. So I looked him up, and I looked him up on the internet, and and, and he was a businessman in a, a neighboring town here, and um, had all you know credentials and everything, and uh, you know wasn't a serial killer or anything like that. So, so um, I called him up. I said, I'm happy to have a cup of coffee with you at Starbucks. Uh, I'll meet you there on this day at this time, and. On that day, I decided I'd look him up one more time, and I and I looked him up, and I was scrolling through the Google pages, and I got down about eight eight pages in Google, literally, and uh, there was an article in there of a gentleman that had a similar name but slightly different, who had been acquitted of espionage. He was a military intelligence officer, and he'd been acquitted of espionage, and I thought, nah, it, you know, it, 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 those coincidences just don't happen that often. I mean, it's not the same guy. So I got to Starbucks and, and the, there was a gentleman sitting out front and he had a copy of the jury master. And so I knew it was him and I introduced myself and I said, hang on a sec, before we get started, I said, are you aware that there's a, there's a guy on the internet with a name very similar to yours who was acquitted of espionage? And he said, that was me. Oh my God. So um, wow. I said, well, tell me your story. So he told me a story and he really wasn't looking to get a story written about his, his life. And, and as it turned out, his story wasn't really sexy anymore. It might have been sexy at the time that he went through it, but the country that, that he was involved in, and, and the, it just, it didn't have that. But I said to him, you know, I've been to Russia. I've been to Moscow and St. Petersburg, and I was there for about three weeks to a month. And I said, I, I've always thought it's a fascinating country, but I was there during Perestroika. Now with Putin, it's really sexy again. Mm -hmm. If I was to put together an espionage story, would you help me? And he said he'd love to. He's a huge reader, big reader. Mm -hmm. So um, the trial is very similar to the trial he underwent. Uh, it's very close. Um, wow. But I didn't have a, a transcript, and I, and I didn't talk to his attorney. The attorney didn't never got a transcript of the year. So, you know, it's still fiction. But... Um, the, the other interesting thing is the way that these things happen is uh, I had gone and done a book signing at the Library for the Blind here in Washington State. And there was a the woman that invited me to speak to the, to the library. Her father decided to come because he was a big reader of my books. And we started chatting and he said, I started telling him about this next book I was going to write. And he got a big smile on his face. And I said, why are you laughing? And he said, because in 1975, I was at the Metropol Hotel in Moscow. That's where my office was. I worked for America Express. What? And I said to him, 
So when you came back to the United States, did you get debriefed by the State Department? And he said, yes, I did. Wow. And I said, are you interested in reading the manuscript? He said, yes, I will. Oh. So he read the manuscript. And then when the book came out, I got another email from a retired CIA officer. And I said, would you be willing to help me down the road? And he said he would. And, and so, you know, I have, I have three pretty good uh, sources that can look things over and tell me if I'm doing them right or wrong. Right, which is so fascinating, and it was really interesting to read, you know, again, in the acknowledgments, just all the people that did help you with all, you know, figuring out and trying to sort of brainstorm the ways that, um, these really clever ways that they were trying to get out of these tough situations that they were in. Um, but, so it sounded, at least, you were probably being very, very generous, but in from the acknowledgments, it sounded like you did a lot of brainstorming around the plot points with some of these people who were real life spies and agents. Is that is that true, do you think? Or yeah, was they, it more they, that you... they, they were very careful. Like yeah. um, the one gentleman, he would say, I could see it happening this way. Oh, okay. Or he would say, I can't see it happening that way. Mm. But he wouldn't he would never divulge, you know, anything sure, that sure, sure. might be a, a problem. Um, you know, the guy that I met at the library, he, he was really fascinating. He called me up and he said, um, you have Jenkins going into a restaurant and using the urinal. And I said, yeah. And he said, we never use urinals. And I said, okay, why not? And he why? Said, yeah. Because your back is to the door and your oh, hands yeah. are occupied. <laughs> mm, that's so interesting. So these he little said, get them yeah. out of the urinal. Okay, very very cool. I love that. Um, and the other thing is Charles Jenkins. Obviously, um, he's just such a wonderful character. I mean, I really and and even um, some of the people who were I, I'm, I don't want to spoil too much, but like people who were maybe possibly the antagonists in the eighth sister you know becomes sort of allies in this and becomes so lovable and i just i i hated to see them in peril in any way um and so it was really really wonderful to see but charles jenkins you know he's based on your law school roommate and i guess there's a part of me that wondered as a writer is that easy does it make it easier to write a character when he is close like physically at least um, to somebody that you're close with and um, and I guess I wanted to sort of know I know that you know your law school roommate wasn't as far as you know a CIA agent um, you know, know who has been in <laughs> Russia and things like that but I'd love to know if you know like his sense of humor he's so funny in some ways he has this very sardonic wit which was just so what a pleasure to read and I wanted to know, like, is is his personality and the cleverness and the sort of st the strategic way that he thinks, is that sort of based on him too also? Well, I will tell you that the wit and the funny comes from the woman hosting this show, Barb Peters. Years ago, uh, uh, I was at uh, an event and she said to me, uh, how come you don't have any humor in your books? readers like to laugh they and i said i don't know and she said well you're funny why don't you put some of the humor in your books and so ever since then i kid you not i have tried to incorporate humor into my novels um oh. because far far knows readers and she knows books and so um i have put humor into the stories and it is a little easier with someone like charlie because charlie was really quick he had a really quick wit. There was not a song that came on the radio that he could not change the words to almost immediately and make it mm -hmm. funny. Um, and he's also a heck of a nice guy. And you know, really what I wanted to get across was that um, when I met these CIA officers, the thing that struck me the most about them was how normal they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, were normal. They, they weren't James Bond and they weren't Jason Bourne. These guys could walk into a restaurant 10 days in a row and you'd never notice them. You'd, right. ne you'd never notice them, you'd never know it. 
Um, and that's part of, of, uh, of their training, but part of the reason why they do what they do. Um, Charlie can't hide. Um, he's going to Russia. Uh, he's African-American. 4% uh, of the population in Russia is African-American. He can't hide. So he has no choice but to use his wits and to run because one of the things that the CIA officers told me was, you don't, we don't even carry guns. If you have to use a gun, you've already lost. Right. So right. he's got to really, he's really got to use his brain in, in both books to try to, to try to get out of, of the situation that he finds himself. And I guess with language, I don't, I don't think that you speak Russian yourself. Is that no. right? But, um, but I mean, obviously the characters do. So there is some Russian back and forth, and yeah. some of it is translated, and some of it's not. And, um, but, you know, the character, uh, Jenkins, he apparently, when he speaks Russian, he's very fluent with no accent because people buy that he's Russian. Like, they don't think, oh, he could be a, uh, an American spy or, or an American tourist or whatever. And which sort of surprised me because it, it does seem like it's really rare for people to be able to speak so fluently, but I guess um, that happens. Well, he, so in, in the jury master, Jenkins first assignment as a CIA officer was he was sent to Mexico City, but he was sent to Mexico City because uh, Mexico City had the largest uh, Soviet embassy, which meant they had the most KGB officers in the world other than Moscow were in, were in Mexico City. So Jenkins went there because he was very good with languages and he had gone and he had uh, gone to the language school, the CIA language school, and he had studied Russian. Um, oh. Now, um, again, I relied on the kindness of strangers to help me with the Russian. Yeah, right. And I was actually asked if I would be interested in doing the, um, the uh, book on tape because I had done Sam Hell and um, I had I had listened to two books on tape that Andrew Gross had written. Um, one was called The Last Man, and the other was called Button Men. And who I said, whoever that announcer is, get it. And it's um, oh, geez, his name just went out of my head. Um, it's Anto Antonio. I want to say Balladini. I know I'm screwing it up, <laughs> but um, he's been the he's been the uh, the audio book award winner male award winner for like two years in a row and he's absolutely oh, wow. fabulous with accents and and i said get him just and they did and he's he's terrific with the accents i could have never done the accents uh and done the words correctly i and so you know one of the things you learn uh in this business is you learn to do what you do well uh and you learn to give up the stuff that you don't do well right okay so on that i want to ask about your um tv series deal for um for this series and um because you and i had talked and you, you told me I, I want you to tell the tell everyone the story that you told me about the script and things like that yeah. um which i find fascinating so i was actually recovering i had my hip replaced <laughs> so i was actually you know on narcotics and getting my hip replaced and uh, I was I was taking phone calls yes. through my um, through yeah. my agent in Los Angeles, uh, Angela um, Chang Kaplan, um, and and she was sending um, Universal Studios and, and all kinds of you know, and I was talking to them and interviewing them, and um, we ended up signing with Roadside Productions, which did Manchester by the Sea and some other yeah. movies, uh, spectacular okay. things. Yeah. And the reason I signed with them is because um, Jen Berman at that at their studio. She started talking about the, the book and she knew it intimately and she's really very, very smart. But um, one of the things I was asked on a, on a number of occasions is, would you like to do the screenplay? And my answer was no, and, um, I don't want to do the screenplay because I'm not a screenwriter and people go to school right. for years to be screenwriters and I would rather have somebody who has an A-list back yep. they've done they've done movies that people recognize they're, they've been acknowledged to be very good um and i wanted that and the other thing is um i thought it would be really um appropriate if that's the right word to have an african-american screenwriter um because charles jenkins is african-american and even though i know him like a brother 
um, I wanted to have a different a different view. Uh, yeah. Something that I might have missed or that I didn't do correctly. Um, you and right. I talked off screen, and I said, you know, I think yeah. the big thing is to just be respectful. Um, yeah. Be respectful of other people's nationalities and and of their ge um, gender and and of their race. Um, but still, I thought it would be I thought having an African American screenwriter would would, would really uh, would really be great. Yeah. You know, that, that reminds me, I, I didn't think to put this onto my list of questions, but it. Um, but I'm now curious. Has your um, law school roommate that, you know, the real life Chaz, um, has he actually, what does he think about all of this? So that, he, did, he, is, he he, one of, is he one of your beta readers so that he, he can he sort of give me pointers? Yeah, I always, let, I always let him read it ahead of time. I always yeah. say to him, I always say to him, Chaz, I would never embarrass you. <laughs> uh, and I and I wouldn't. Um, you know, he, he, as you said, uh, he's not a CIA officer, and, and right. obviously, you know, I've I've used his name and I've used his likeness. Um, he's a really good-looking African American man. I used to kid him all the time. I'd say, men cross the street to get away from him, and women cross the street to get in front of him, um, mm -hmm. because he was really big, really well built, and and a good-looking guy. Um, and so I just, you know. I, I just, I always said to him, I was going to put him in a book, and he always said that would never happen. Um, and so I just, I just wanted to do it. And That's so fun. He's, he's got some kids of his own now, and I think they get a big kick out of it. But yeah, I, I was going to ask. His family must love it. Like, you know, his wife and kids. Uh, I can't imagine. That would be so fun. Um, so I wanted to ask a couple of um, writing questions, because as, you know, a debut writer and I'm you know banging my head against the wall right now working on my second um you have three books coming out in the next 12 months yeah what in the world like how do you do that what are what is your secret what are your tips what can you tell the rest of us so we can hope that some of the genius rub and productivity runs rubs off on us yeah, I don't know. I don't know if the genius is gonna rub off. I, I, my wife, would, <laughs> my wife would dispute that. I'm sure, but um, uh, you know, um, I guess there's two ways I can answer that. One is I, I absolutely love what I do. I, I mean, I absolutely love to write books. I mean, I, I can't think. I mean, I literally get up in the morning. I feel very blessed, and I know there are a lot of people going through some very difficult times right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I know it's not easy for them to hear. Um, and I sympathize with them, um, but I, I am not really blessed that I get to get up every morning and, and do what I love. And so to me, it's not work. To me, it's really, it's creating and, and, and it's, it's just, I, I, it, there's not a better feeling in the world really than when I, when I complete that first draft when I know I got a new book. The other thing is I'm a journalist by background and I'm a lawyer by background. And as you know, right. <laughs> from practicing law, there are times when you do your best in the time that you have, and you don't have yeah. a lot of time. You know, you got to get a reply brief done in, in two hours and get it filed. Yeah. And, and, you know, back in my day before our email and stuff, that meant a messenger coming, picking it up. I mean, and so, you know, you learn, you learn how to write quickly. Um, and I think the other thing is I have a really good ear for dialogue, and I think that's because I took so many depositions in my life. I mean, I probably took 10,000 depositions in 10 years. Um, wow. And, and so I, I, I got an opportunity to really hear how people speak. Um, and I'll give, another, I'll give another compliment to Barb, which was, you know, uh, books are about action and dialogue. And so get your characters moving and talking. And, um, and that's what I try to do. So, you know, they're 400-page books, but they're fast reads because my characters are moving and talking. And... and um, and the book that, so the books that are coming out, the Jenkins book will be out uh, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow, um, yay. The Tracy Crosswhite book number Thank eight you. will be out um, in wow. April. And then I have mm -hmm. my second literary novel coming out the following April, uh, following September by Lake Union. And okay. uh, I'm really excited about that. It's a, it's a coming of age story for young men. It's about about an 18 year old uh, who graduates from high school and all he wants to do is have his last, it's 1979. He wants to have his last summer with his friends, and he goes to work on a construction crew with two Vietnam veterans, including one who's having PTSD. Mm. So it's um, 
it's really, it, I, I'm really excited about it and Lake Union's excited about it. And, you know, um, as you know, from, you know, from your writing, um, you get excited about something and you lose time and, and you just, you just go and you just do it. That's awesome. Um, and, but there was something about chess in the potential title of that literary oh, it, So the literary novel, it's, it's called The World Played Chess. But it's based it's based on the quote the world played chess while I played checkers, mm. and so, so it's a book about a young man coming of age and not really understanding what the world is all about. Okay, got it. Okay, all right. Um, I thought th I, I based on some of our yeah. correspondence about that and the chess in this book, I thought, oh, maybe he's some national master or something, and <laughs> just don't know about it yet. Um, I guess one thing that I'd love to ask you is, you know, so you've written series, thriller series, both espionage and legal thrillers, and you've also written standalone th thrillers, and you've also written some literary novels. Is there a different writing process that you have for those sort of three different types, or maybe even four, if you consider um, you know, legal thriller to be different from espionage thriller, maybe in structure or something like that. I would love, I mean, it, it, does the literary especially um, take a different um, structure or process or length of time needed to complete anything like that? Or is it just all similar? Uh, the, liter the literary novels tend, tend to take more time, but really um, books are about story. And, and stories are about characters. And I think if you ask, you know, all the readers that, uh, you know, are out there when you go to a book signing or, or even hopefully on Zoom, um, they'll tell you that what they care about is they care about, they will, they will read a book if there's a character that they love. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're writing, you know, a police procedural or a legal thriller or a literary novel or an espionage novel, if they don't love the characters, it doesn't matter what the characters are doing. Um, they're not going to get in, get into the book. So, you know, my, my focus is always on trying to create characters that readers will either love or hate, but hopefully care about. And if I can do that, then I feel like, you know, I'm accomplishing uh, what I set out to do as a writer. I also really believe that there's a bond that writers make with readers. And that bond is that I'm going to put out a book that's worth, worthy of your money and your time. You know, a book takes six to seven hours or longer for some people to read. And that's, that's a significant investment. It's not like going to the movies for two hours. And so I think there's a bond there. And that bond is, says, look, I'm, I'm putting out something here that's worth your time and your yeah. money. And, I, and yeah. I, take that bond, I take that bond seriously. I, I, I think that we are as good as our last book. And so yeah. every book we have to write, we have to write it as if it's our last book. Do you think that some um, readers take that a little bit farther in the sense that, you know, so if they got sort of hooked on you and your books because they read your legal thrillers first, let's say, and then you turn to espionage thrillers and they're like, wait, I don't really, I'm not really into that. Or, you know, then they read your, um, you know, literary book and you, they sort of go, well, this isn't what I expected. Um, from Bob Dugoni, like, do you, do you, do you ever get that, or or do you feel like once they're sort of, you know, your fans, they they tend to sort of stay loyal to you in general? I'm so, asking selfishly as as somebody who's contemplating the different genres yeah. and things like that. No, I think first of all, Amazon Publishing is really really smart. I mean, they're really smart. And so right when I wrote the literary novel, they told me we are not going to market to your thriller fans because that's mm. not fair to thriller fans. We are going right. to market to our literary fans. If your mm. thriller fans cross over, terrific. But we don't want to market to your thriller fans and then have exactly what you said. You have right. a situation right. where your thriller fans are going, what the heck is this? This is not a yeah. thriller. And so I think a lot of it is in, is in the marketing and the marketing is done by Amazon Publishing. And right. they are, they are really smart and they are really uh, intelligent about how they do it. Now, I will say that I, I have received emails, but most of those emails have been pleasantly surprised. Oh, okay. been, you know, when I first started this, I was wondering where it was going, but I have to tell you, I really, really enjoyed it. And the other thing I will tell you is I've never 
receive the type of emails that I that I received for um, for the extraordinary life of Sam Howell. Um, mm -hmm. There was there was something about that book that grabbed people at a level that my 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 genre fiction did not did not grab them at the same level, mm -hmm. um, and uh, really heartwarming and heartbreaking stories about what people have gone through in their own life that they could relate to Sam. So um, it's been a, it was a great opportunity for me to um, to hear from readers about how invested readers get into a story which sort of goes back to that same thing I was saying before is um, you really have to, you have to respect that bond uh, because, you know, for some readers, it's, it's more than just a book. It's yeah. in a lot, in a lot of ways. For them. Yeah. And therapy, I mean, in the same way that it can be writing it too, yeah. you know, and uh, in writers groups and things. Um, what about series versus standalone? Um, I feel like once you, have a character in mind and once you've sort of developed them and you got to get to know them and you know their voices and all of that sort of stuff it has to make the writing easier what do you it, it, thoughts um i think series are tough because yeah. um okay. you, you, well you can you can write a series it really go in one or two ways you can have the james bond and the jason Bourne type or the jack reacher uh where the character is always the same right you start the book and the character is the exact same every time from the very beginning. They get to yep. the end, they may have changed during the book, but the next book they're back to who they were. Um, I didn't want to do that with my characters. I wanted my characters to evolve. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to live. I wanted them to suffer, you know, uh, all the pains that we suffer in real life and, and also experience all the, all the wonderful things that we experience in life, getting married, having kids, and how that impacts your life, how that, how that influences how you are able to do things. You know, I spent today... Uh, at my my daughter's first uh, 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 house apartment, uh, uh, putting up uh, deadbolts and, and and blinds and locks on the windows, you know, you never stop being a parent. And and so, how does that influence your character? When suddenly your character, they're not just, they don't just have a job. She's not just a Seattle homicide detective. She's a spouse and she's, yeah. a, she's a mother, and she's got to get childcare and. You know, how, how does that impact them? That's the kind of book that I wanted to write. The difficulty with that is coming up with something fresh every yeah. time I write a book, um, trying to have something new, something interesting, something intriguing um, that keep that'll, that'll keep the series fresh. Yeah. And also just, I mean, even thinking about the character arc, um, and again, I'm being sort of selfish because I'm picking your brain for something that's troubling me right now um you know i'm my second novel is based on characters that have gone through something in a short story of mine and you know and i was like wait so this is in a way a sequel what i'm writing is a sequel to the short story and and it occurred to me i can't have the same character arc because i had that arc in the short story and it came to a resolution and the character learned from it and, you know, evolved and whatever. And so, and, and I thought, you know, and, and I was thinking, I have this great opportunity coming up with you. I'm going to ask Bob about this because it's really hard. It's hard to figure out like what is a new character arc that's based on the same character's background that feels fresh. Yeah, you know, um, I teach a, I teach a, uh, it's called the Novel Writing Intensive, and we just finished last week uh, with a week, week long seminar, uh, two three day seminars. And so one of the things I always, I always tell characters is, I always tell students is, we don't write books about ordinary people doing ordinary things. Mm -hmm. We, that, that's, that's not interesting. We write about ordinary people doing extraordinary things or ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I always ask, all of us have been in extraordinary circumstances, whether it's the loss of someone we love, the loss of a pet that we love, whether it's you know coming down with a, a, an illness, um, COVID-19, a lot of people lost, lost relatives and friends close to them. And so I always ask the students, how does that change the character? Yeah. And that's what I try to pay attention to in this book, you know, and, and in The Last Agent, that's what I wanted to really pay attention to is Charles Jenkins has a lot to lose. He's yeah. married. He's got two children. He's got a baby daughter, right? 
And, and so this is not an ordinary guy in an ordinary situation. This is an ordinary guy in a very deadly, dangerous situation. And the loss is not just to him personally. It would be devastating to his wife and to his kids. He's got a lot to lose. There's a lot at stake. And so I always tell, you know, new writers, you know, wh what is it? What's the so what in your story? If your character fails, what's the consequence? And if the consequence isn't big enough, then you might not have a big enough story. So for Charles Jenkins, the consequence is twofold. One, the, the woman who saved his life is going to be killed. And two, he may lose his life and his family will suffer the, his loss. So there's big stakes. And I think the best books out there are the books that, that have big stakes. And by big stakes, I mean, the protagonist has the most to lose. Yeah. No. I think that's a really no, valid point, Bob. And I, I'm going to intervene here for a moment because one of the things yeah. I, I particularly love about this book and The A Sister is the changing landscapes. I mentioned it earlier. I really love the geography of these books. And, you know, stories are different, I think, when you travel rather than stay in, in one place. And so this is a story in which Charles Jenkins is, is uprooted from his home and faces going to a horrendous prison in Moscow to see whether the woman there is somebody that he owes something to. But to get there, he has to basically backtrack the journey that he took in the A sister. Now, I have been, as I mentioned earlier, to Turkey and been across the Black Sea, which is truly one of my very favorite trips I've ever taken. So how did you do sketching in the landscapes? I mean, I know how you sketch in the characters, but how do you sketch in the landscapes? I'm assuming you haven't personally gotten in a small boat and gone up the, the Bosphorus <laughs> the Dardanelles and, you know, floated across the Black Sea to arrive in, where does he get off, in Odessa? I can't remember. So, um, how, I, I, I traveled to Moscow, I traveled to St. Petersburg, I traveled to Oslo. Um, I have a good friend who's Norwegian and has made that crossing across the Gulf of Finland into St. Petersburg right. and other places many times. So I, I relied on him. Uh, and he, he really was in a situation one time where he was on a ship and the Gulf of Finland froze and they were stuck. Uh, and along with a lot of other boats. And, and so, you know, what do you do in that situation? Um, I have never been to Turkey, but the CIA officer who helped me with the ace sister, he had been to Turkey and he had taken that route uh, to get out. He, he had gone uh, uh, wow. into Greece, uh, from down into Turkey and then into Greece and then over. And so um, I rely a lot on, on people that have done it before. And, and now that you've told me, Barb, I might be calling you to help me. Well, I, <laughs> if you go back to Turkey, you're good, because I've spent a lot of time in Turkey. I've actually driven all over. We hired a car and a driver. I've driven with him all over yeah. Turkey. Um, was amazed to find that Cappadocia is just like New Mexico. I mean, we were all excited to go there. When we got there, I looked at Rob and I said, there are the mesas, there are the hoodoos, it's a caldera. <laughs> it's just like around Santa Fe, you know? I mean, and I think, you know, maybe it was because I grew up reading the Oz books. I was absolutely enchanted with the Oz books from my childhood. And in the Oz books, when you change provinces, counties, whatever you want to call it, all the colors change. So if yeah. you're in Munchkin land, everything's blue. And if you wind up, you know, in the West, everything is yellow. So I, I always expect different landscapes in different countries to be a different I hope color or something, you know? And I'm so shocked right. when I find right. out that they really look mostly like every place else. Yeah, I had hoped um, to go to Egypt because the, the next Jenkins book, I really wanted him to get out and go through, through Egypt. And, you know, with COVID going on now, the trip was yeah. canceled. Oh, you are so and lucky. It, I spent December in Egypt. I know. So oh, I, may, I, may be call, I may be calling you if, uh, if I have to get him out of, out of Egypt because I, I really, I was really looking forward to going and it, it's just not going to happen. It's an absolutely yeah. marvelous country. It, it was my second trip there and quite different than, um, than the first one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I also wanted to ask or say, way back at the beginning, Angie, when you were talking to Bob, um, Bob, Bob, more than almost any author I know, 
is really passionate about telling stories. And back in the beginning, after he'd written two or three books, um, it, it wasn't going as well as it could. And, and I realized that what Bob was really unhappy about, not so much that he might have to go back to being a lawyer, you know, publisher <laughs> practice, um, but what he really, really was upset about was the thought that he would not get to tell more stories. And that engaged mm. me at a level with you, Bob, that, you know, more than almost any other author, I was determined that we were going to find a way for you to continue to write because it was such a passion for you. Yeah. And, you know. It really is. Yeah. It's a passion. That's it's so pa wonderful. That's so wonderful to hear because I'm, you know, I, I, I'm the kind of writer that says sort of in jest, but not really in jest, that I hate writing. And, um, I love having written though there there is i agree with you there's nothing like having finished a good draft or even like a paragraph that i love or even a sentence um and i love that so much um but just the process of it and getting you know that's why i have a wi-fi less you know writing nook because i get so easily distracted and i'm such a procrastinator and um, and I used to sort of, you know, pull all-nighters, writing briefs and things like that, that I had two weeks to write um, and stupid shenanigans like that. And so it's really such a breath of fresh air to hear a writer say that you just love the entire process. That's yeah, very when I was, cool. When I, was a, when I was little, I mean, when I was in the seventh grade, um, my mother would hand me books to, uh, you know, to, to keep me busy. Um, and she would hand me books like the Mount, the Count of Monte Cristo and the Old Man in the Sea and Of Mice and Men, um, you know, I mean, classics, The Great Gatsby. And I, I fell in love with story. I, I fell in love with books. I fell in love with stories. I fell in love with characters. Um, I always thought I would write books like that, which is what was so what was so pleasant for me when I wrote Sam Pell. Is I kind of was fulfilling a wish that I had since I was a little boy. Uh, I, I grew up reading uh, Lonesome Dove and um, uh, all, you know all, all sort of the class of Patrick Conroy, John Irving, um, and you know what Barb talks about it is true. I mean, there was a there was a point in time in my career, and we, I was down in Phoenix, and she said, "What's going on?" And I said, "Well, I'm 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 being let go, and she, and I have to come up with a new book idea." And she said, "Well, do you have any ideas?" And I said, "Well, I do have an idea," and we actually went back to her house and sat on her patio and began to sketch the outlines of my sister's grave with and we sort of sketched out you know what I could do with her and how I might do it and um and that's the book that put me on the map so when Bart Peter says jump, I say how high. <laughs> no, we're not going to go that far. I'm going to add before Patrick has arrived back in case there's a question or two. But the other thing, Angie, that sure. that was left out is that Bob has a very large and very richly rewarding family. And I think having grown up as one of, what are you, one of nine, isn't it? Ten. Ten, right. Wow. One of ten children. And he has so much... Um, family to draw upon, you know, for character and stories. He doesn't have to go out hunting down other people. A family no. that size would, would provide you with a lifetime worth of, of oh, material. I'm jealous. Oh. I'm, I'm an only child and so is my husband. And we're always sort of saying how, you know, we wish we had a bigger family. We were going to have five kids, but then we got three, three boys and we were like, okay, that's enough. Enough is enough. <laughs> Let me check with Patrick. Do you have any questions okay. or comments over there? Um, maybe just a couple here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Bob, you have a lot of people watching and, um, you know, a lot of people that interestingly uh, mention specifically meeting you here at the Poison Pen bookstore. And oh, that, that's, that's really so cool. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Um, one question that came in was, of all the characters that you've written, do you have any favorites? Well, um, you know, Tracy Crosswhite is obviously a favorite because um, without her, I wouldn't be here. Uh, and, and so that she obviously has a very close place in my heart. Um, and Sam Hell, I think, will linger with me till the day I die. I mean, he's just a character that, um, that just came to me and, and I feel like I know him 
as well as I know anyone. So I, I'd say that those two are the two really that um, that are really I'm very that I'm, I'm close with, uh, you know, in a strange way that only writers can appreciate. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, another good question. Uh, Chris asks, do you consciously and purposefully think about avoiding falling into a formula? Um, I'll answer it this way. I have spent 20 years studying story structure. Um, and, and I mean that literally. L literally studying story structure and trying to understand story structure and its interrelationship with characters and it's in a relationship with tension and, and all those things. So um, I try to write books that are a surprise to me. Um, the book I just finished that'll be out next April, the Tracy Crosswhite book, In Her Tracks, um, the ending was a complete and total surprise to me. So, you know, I tell people that I don't outline. Um, I, I write as an organic writer but I always caution that I, I'm an organic writer, but I'm an organic writer that has studied story structure, but I love it uh, for 20 years. So um, what I try to do is I try to give readers what they expect and then pull that rug out from under them and give them something that they, they never thought was coming, but they, they understand is inevitable. That's a wonderful answer. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's see. Somebody named Dan asks, uh, he says, you could publish with any of the big houses. What makes Amazon Publishing so smart and special? And why are your bookshelves so empty behind you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the bookshelves are empty behind you because this is a brand new office, right? This is a brand new office that was just built, and I just moved into it yesterday so that I could do this here. Um, so that's the reason why I so that so uh, thing. Amazon Publishing. I'll give you. I'll give you a story that'll make. I think it make it more understandable. They're uh, obviously out here uh, located in Seattle, as am I. And so, uh, um, when they were interested in my sister's grave, uh, they asked me to go to lunch, and I went to lunch with them. And I sat down at the table, and I was the oldest person there by probably a good twenty years, and I was probably fifty five. Uh, and, and I was much older than, than a large majority of them there. And we started to talk and all of a sudden they started telling me things that I never knew. Uh, who my audience was, how old my audience was, where the geography was. Um, and, and, you know, I said to them, literally, I said, um, is there somebody in your organization that can help me with uh, social media? And um, the, uh, my editor at the time, Alan Turkis, he looked at me and he said, Bob, we think that the best thing a writer can do is write the next great book. Yeah. And let us do the marketing and the promotion. And they have been true to their word. And that's another reason, Angie, why I can put out more than one book a year is because um, they are really supportive of me. Um, they do all the videos that you'll see on, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, they're now working on my website. I mean, they're really behind the scenes doing all that stuff, which frees me up to do what I do well, which is to write books. And I try to stay away from everything else, you know, the screenwriting, the, I, I, I try to focus on what, just what I do well. And, and, and they've just been great about taking care of everything else for me. And I, we and I spoke off camera and I told you it's, it's, uh, it's the first time that I ever felt like I really had a, a partner, a publishing partner that was, just as interested in seeing my success as as I was, so um, you know, there's. I think that um, I just think that they're they're very good at, at at they know what they do well also, and what they do well is is they get books in readers' hands, and they allow readers to tell other readers when a book is good, and um, they're just really smart about it. Mm. All right, I got, let's see, one last question that just came in. And uh, I suppose this would be for both of you, Angie and Bob. Uh, and she writes, Demetria, or Demetra writes, what is the most difficult moment in writing a novel, and by contrast, the easiest? For me, the easiest is the idea. The hardest part is executing the idea. Uh, 
because I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I wanted Charles Jenkins to go into Russia in, in the last agent and the, the, uh, the possible woman is being held in Lepertovo prison, which is the worst prison that you can get sent to in, in Moscow. That's where all the political prisoners go, the dissidents, everyone else. And I mean, it's almost possible, impossible to get out. And so I, I put her in there and I got it all set up and then I had to get her out. <laughs> How do you do it? And I literally sat for three days and I'm not exaggerating for three days. And I just stared at my computer and I came up with scenarios and dismissed them and another scenario and dismissed it and another one and dismissed it until finally I was asleep one night and I woke up and I understood how it might happen. And I called my sister. This goes back to my family, Barb. I called my sister, Bonnie, who's a clinical pharmacist. And I said, is there a drug out there that you could give someone that would make them appear to be blank? And she said, yeah. And I said, I need to talk to you about it. And I was able to get her out. So it, that, you know, that's the, the hard part is the execution. The easy part for me is the, are the ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for me, it's, you know, I, I don't think any part of this is easy, but the fun stuff for me that seems easy are, yeah, the premise. I have so many ideas for stories. I, I just, I, I just, the hard part is picking like which one I'm going to work on next. Um, and, um, and I also love revising and editing it's just so fun for me and um and fun to sort of see it take shape and to me the hardest part is just getting the sentences and you know and the paragraphs down that first draft you know and really just sculpting it and uh it's it's a grind but and i love it once it's done or even halfway done even just the first draft but just Getting that first draft, oh, it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. Every writer's process is different. I, Patrick and I have listened to hundreds of writers talk about their process. And, you know, it works differently for every single person. Absolutely. So you just yeah. have to have confidence that you will get there. Finishing a book is the best start. If you never write a book, you'll never know if you can do it. But once you've done that, you should have some confidence that you can do it again, however difficult it may be, which is the reason. Unless, that, it, unless it was a fluke, you know, well, which is what I'm thinking about my second book right now. I'm like, hmm, some that people, first book, I, I, I don't know that I can do it again. I don't know. Yeah. Once, I've, yeah. once I've done two, I think I might have a little more confidence that I could get a third. I don't know. Who knows? Does it? Do you ever have days like that, Bob, where you're like, I don't know if I can write another one. I don't know. Maybe no. the first 20 were no. flips. No. No. no, no, that is not Bob's problem at all. <laughs> Bob's problem is, will he have time to write all the books that he wants to, right. which is a completely right, right. different yeah. problem. And That's you know great. what? There are one book writers. You know, there are people who have written one book and then- Thanks for that, no, Barb. I'm, a great I'm, thing to say to me right now. Wait, let me finish. But. But those people are almost always authors who have done something like Gone with the Wind or To Kill a Mockingbird. Kill a Mockingbird. And, and they, I think that that kind of success on your first book can truly paralyze you in a way that, um, you know, and obviously Miracle Creek has had a huge success, and I'm not suggesting that it didn't. But it, it didn't fly into the same stratosphere, which I think must be completely intimidating. So yeah. I, you know, well, I'm sure that you will wrestle this book. It's the, the second book is usually the hardest book ever to write. Yeah. And yeah. you know, you will get to it. The the point is, you point it is power through a first draft, and once you've got it, then you can do the thing yeah. you like, which is revise it and see how it goes. You're back, Patrick. Yeah. Was there another question? <laughs> well. Um, it just made me think we haven't seen anything from uh, uh, Gillian Flynn in a while, have we? No, not since to... 2012, actually. That's a lot of uh, pressure. But, isn't she, but she's doing a lot of TV stuff, I think. Isn't she TV and movie stuff? Probably. Yeah, she always I, think, did. I, think she, I think she might be. You know, I, Barb, you raise a really good point. And, and I think, um, you know, I know Demetria is actually a writer. Uh, she's a New York attorney and she's a writer. Um, and I think you raise a really good point, which, which is just, 
you know, I think we all need to understand what, what, what our um, reality is. And my reality is uh, storytelling. And that's what I'm good at. And I stay, try to just try to stay away from the things that, that other people are good at and let them do their job. Um, and, you know, Andy, you obviously can write. You obviously have incredible success with Miracle Creek. You'll write your second book and your third book and your fourth book. It'll happen. You just, you know, it, you just, you'll do it because you're a storyteller. It's what you do. Just don't get into all the other things. I don't want to write screenplays. I don't want to write plays. I don't want to narrate all my audio books. I want to write mm -hmm. stories. But I think yeah. focus is an essential part. Um, it really does make a big difference, you know. It's the same thing here in the bookstore, you know. It's easy to lose focus and, and go astray and then, and then come back to the basics. This has been terrific, guys, and we have been here for an yeah. hour, which I think is kind of as long as most people actually want to sit still. Um, so I want to thank you. Angie, it's been wonderful to see you again. And Robert, it's always it's a pleasure. Fun. And now I will know that I can put April on my calendar. And we will do this again. With any luck, you'll get to come back. Because one of the I things so. I really like about Amazon as a bookseller is that they bring in a whole team with Bob. So if we're doing an event with him, you know, they bring down um, a number of supporting players, which makes yeah. it very Aww. easy for us. No, it's lovely. Um, yeah. You know, they, they're very much a team approach to how they go about things. And yeah. um, and that that's very nice for Bob. It's also very nice for us. So thank yeah, my, you. My, public, my publicist flies all the way in, Danelle Catlett. She flies all the way in from New York City. Sometimes she just flies in literally for the event and flies out. So oh wow, uh, yeah, yeah. she does. And, yep. and we uh, we have a lot of fun when we're there, don't we, Barb? We really do. You know, we've yeah. explored restaurants. Um, um, we're going to hope that some of our favorites survive COVID and that we'll be able oh, to go back yeah. to them. In any case, thank you all for watching us this evening. Thanks for your questions. Yes, and Let here's a toast to Bob and to his four hundred thousandth book <laughs> that's out tomorrow. Right. <laughs> and don't forget that we do have autographed copies of The Last Agent, which I, I truly think is the best spy story by, that I have read this year and wow. in many respects ever. But I really, really loved it. And I hope that you will, too. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it.